Presentamos esa, esta sesión de Bau Talks eh, dentro del ciclo de conferencias del Máster de Diseño, Tecnología e Innovación en Moda. Eh, os quiero, hemos traído a Rick Liskit en esta ocasión para presentar eh, eh, su método de patronaje cinético. Pero no quiero enumerar como el, su currículum, que es largo, lo que quiero contaros es como mi experiencia. ¿no? Hace cuatro años estuve en un workshop con él en Madrid, donde nos enseñó como su método. Y esta fecha de hace cuatro años es importante porque hoy en día, en esos cuatro años, ya están saliendo las primeras generaciones eh, influidas por este método de trabajo y esta forma de, de pensar la moda como orientada hacia un futuro más sostenible, más ético y más tecnológico. Eh, en estos momentos también hay gente que está haciendo eh, sus trabajos de, de máster y sus trabajos finales de grado eh, presentando en, en el Clo 3D eh, de manera virtual y haciendo fittings virtuales tanto que reales. Se están presentando videojuegos, se están presentando animaciones en moda, o sea, creo que hemos aplicado toda esta tecnología que me influyó en aquel momento y el, y el Ricard ha sido un referente y una guía a seguir. Eh, también me da pie a pensar todo lo que es investigación en moda, que entonces eh, lo entendí. Eh, él, mediante un estudio como del patronaje y del cuerpo, ¿no sabes? teniendo en cuenta eh, los puntos claves del movimiento del cuerpo mediante la biomecánica, eh, eh, hace, envuelve ¿no? a través de un patronaje de, como de casi de una sola pieza que evita costuras ¿no? eh, y luego la, la aplicación en la tecnología, o sea, cuando allí nos enseñaba y pasaba del, del modelaje sobre el cuerpo a, a lo virtual, bueno, no, me marcó totalmente. Dije, este es el rol del diseñador del futuro, alguien que está ahorrando... Eh, en prototipos, ¿no? que está diseñando lo mismo de manera virtual que real, que sabe modelar, que sabe patronar y, y esto lo hemos implementado en BAU desde aquel entonces. Eh, luego también tiene que ver mucho con el impacto medioambiental, todo este ahorro de, de prototipos y de prendas, ¿no? este aprendizaje virtual también mucho menos físico y, y costoso, eh, también me me impactó y me dio datos para, para guiar aquí a Moda de Bau. Eh, pero lo más importante es el, el rol del siglo XXI, ¿no? que trabajaba en equipo, que da un valor al equipo y, y el sistema de compartir en colectivo como sin jerarquías. Eh, abierto siempre a la transmisión de conocimiento, haciendo eh, difusión de todo lo aprendido en cinco años de investigación que trascendían en una tesis y un doctorado. Y luego la importancia de no ver al diseñador eh, de moda desde esa primera persona, ¿no? de yo quiero esto, sino desde no de satisfacer su ego ¿no? queriendo hacer cosas, sino desde el punto de vista del impacto positivo que tiene sobre la sociedad. Eh, os presento también a Joan Ross, que guía el máster de Diseño, Tecnología e Innovación en Moda, y que dará paso también a la serie de preguntas que queráis hacerle. Bueno, simplemente ahora veremos, veremos un poco el, un vídeo explicatorio del máster. Eh, como ha dicho Elisa, ¿no? la, la dirección que está tomando Bau en Moda nace en parte gracias a Ricardo y también el máster justamente se quiere centrar en esta visión. Entonces, como para, para pasar un poco por encima en el máster, por ejemplo, lo que se está... Bueno, lo que se pretende conseguir es hacer un o sea, diseño crítico. Eh, hay parte de diseño especulativo, es decir, cómo formular estos futuros próximos desde la perspectiva de moda, qué cosas dentro del sistema podemos cambiar y qué herramientas eh, necesitamos para cambiar este sistema. Entonces, dentro del máster hay desde la parte más teórica ¿no? de, de pues eso, proyectos de, de diseño especulativo hasta eh, investigación textil, eh, materiales eh, biointeligentes etcétera, etcétera, modelaje 3D, que nos permiten formular con nuevas herramientas también ¿no? estos nuevos futuros para solventar problemáticas presentes. ¿no? Es un poco... Entonces, um, nada, veremos el vídeo para, para un poco ver el, el tema del máster y después ya damos paso a Ricardo.
Bueno, también decir, eh, si tenéis dudas al final, eh, si queréis las podéis hacer en inglés para que las entienda Ricard, si no, hacerlas en castellano e intentamos traducirlas y ya está. ¿vale? Los diseñadores y diseñadoras de hoy tienen la responsabilidad de decidir cómo será la moda de mañana. Frente a un sistema de producción en crisis y las diversas realidades sociales y culturales, la experimentación y la innovación son esenciales para repensar el diseño textil y de moda hacia modelos más sostenibles y éticos. El programa aporta una visión crítica y constructiva e introduce metodologías de investigación innovadoras. Se trabaja con tecnología de última generación, como el modelaje corporal digital, el patronaje por ordenador, la impresión 3D o el corte láser, y materiales de vanguardia como biotextiles, tejidos inteligentes, tejidos electrónicos e interactivos. Todo para pensar y crear la moda desde la innovación. El profesorado está compuesto por profesionales de la moda con amplio dominio de los nuevos métodos de investigación y producción empleados en la industria. BAU dispone de aulas y talleres con todo el equipamiento necesario para la práctica del diseño. Todo ello en un entorno de creatividad e innovación en el corazón del Poble Nou 22 Arroba, el Distrito Tecnológico y del Diseño de Barcelona. El máster prepara a los diseñadores y diseñadoras para repensar y redefinir el diseño textil y de moda de manera responsable y sostenible, siendo protagonistas de los cambios que la sociedad necesita. Hi, Ricard. Hello, looks good. How are you? I'm good, fine. Okay, now we are all ears for you. <laughs> all right. Okay. So thanks for the uh, introduction. I'm afraid my uh, Spanish is extremely limited, uh, so I didn't really uh, understand. But um, I'm going to share my screen, and then we'll start. There we go. Uh, so thanks for in, for inviting me for speaking here today. Uh, I don't know if you presented me at all before, but I'm I'm a, I'm a fashion designer and a researcher based in Sweden. Um, I'm going to talk today about what I call Fashion 3.0 uh, here, and that is first kinetic garment construction, and second part will be sort of the digital paradigm shift. Um, and kinetic garment construction, that's the part which is sort of based on my previous academic research. Uh, and The digital paradigm shift is, that's more work I've been doing around 3D visualization techniques uh, during the last five years and current projects and thoughts I have around that. Um, and yeah, you see that's below there is my contacts. There's an Instagram account, our industry and a website, ourindustry.com. Uh, so we'll start with, The kinetic garment construction, which was the title of the PhD thesis I presented in 2015, I believe. Uh, foundations of, of pattern cutting. With the foundations here, I, I'm talking about the theoretical models uh, in garment construction or sort of how, how things come together. and. And yeah, and now today with, with the uh, title of, of Fashion 3.0, uh, which is then um, a connection to sort of Web 3.0, which is something which is implementing now. And we see a new generation of, of internet uh, emerging. Then here, here I'm thinking of a, what, what can be garment construction point one, two, and three. Point oh. And then, then I see garment construction 1.0 is how we humans dressed sort of in, in ancient times or before tailoring, before uh, we started to cut into fabrics at all. We just had hand, hand woven, very valuable fabrics. And at that time, uh, one either draped uh, 
a piece of fabric around the body, as in the sari or toga or Scottish kilt, or they different variations exist in different cultures, or garments were constructed out of rectangular pieces uh, with no shaping in them. Um, so, and 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 th and this is we still have garments today being constructed in this way, like kimonos and saris, and so it's, there's, there's a long tradition here. Uh, then, then garment construction 2.0 is here what I label kind of 98% of all the garments that we wear today, which are constructed based on a theoretical understanding uh, of the body and the relation between body and, and garments, which was, uh, which I, I, I denote the tailoring matrix. That means this theoretical framework of horizontal and vertical lines, which was defined during the 19th century. Uh, then parallel to industrialization, uh, mainly German and English tailors started putting together uh, sort of um, engineered instructions of how to replicate garments. So, so if, if, if you're a classic tailor, you measure the body lengthwise and crosswise, and then you draft a pattern for a jacket or a pair of trousers or whatever it can be inside of that uh, matrix. And if you are a dressmaker in, in the haute couture in Paris, in the more traditional sense, then you drape uh, the, your dresses on a mannequin, but that mannequin is marked with the same lines. And so it's, it's these, the, 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 this is sort of the theoretical underlying system of, of all garments around the world today. Or not all, but all, it's, it's been spread parallel to industrialization of, of the textile industry. And it's, th this is a way of constructing garment that is being taught in all pattern cutting schools and design schools that I ever visited or came across. Um, and this is how I learned drafting garments when I went to tailoring school 20 years ago. Um, and it's very sort of efficient in the way that it's now universal and used all across the globe. The background of this is that it, it really tells us more about 19th century garment and culture and society than the moving body and, and, and how we might function today and fabrics we use today. So in, in my research, I draw out some... Um, principles and thoughts of what could be garment construction 3.0 by studying fabrics in motion uh, and bodies in motion and those two in interaction with each other. And that's what I then call kinetic garment construction and a theoretical approach sort of based in from or derived from practical experiments uh, on live moving bodies. Um, and there I paid special attention to um, these um, directions in the skin, Langer's lines, which is traditionally used in, in surgery. Uh, but I, I realized that they're also very good visual notations for where the skin expands when the body moves. And if one looks at these lines, then yeah, here, here's another visualization, or not a visualization, but this is actually a photo of a hundred year old a naked woman. And here you see these lines in the skin very clearly. And the, the body then stretches less, or the skin stretches less along these lines and more across. 
And it's quite obvious that the 19th century tailors, they did not really take this in, in consideration when they set up this tailoring matrix system. So what I did in the, during my research tenure was to propose an alternative visual model of how to think and act while constructing garments um, for a moving body. And visually it turned out like these lines and points here. And from a research point of view uh, or like a design research point of view, then, then one can say that one had, there are two competing theoretical models. Uh, one here, the classic, uh, classic tailoring matrix and two, the kinetic garment construction uh, theory. And when starting out from two different theoretical understandings of something, you are quite likely to end up with different results, visually and functionally. And that can be compared to any other sort of practice where one uses theoretical models, for example. I say, for example, physics. If you, if you go out and do experiments in physics based on Newton's classical physics or based on quant physics, then you will have different uh, end results, and you will come up to different conclusions. Or if you use the Pantone system in color, theoretical system in col in when working with colors, or if you use the RGB or SUMIC system, you will have slightly different alliances. So then it, it, it turned out that approaching the body like this and working with the um, stretch capabilities of fabric in different ways, I was able to design and come up with uh, sort of function wear, which had uh, other fe uh, another feeling than earlier and another function. So for a few years, I did a lot of uh, developments for Solomon uh, in France doing uh, mountaineering and ski wear uh, stuff where we used mainly rigid Gore-Tex fabrics, but by utilizing the bio stretch in those fabrics, we managed to have a feeling of a stretch quality from a rigid fabric. Um, and here is an illustration of the pattern layout of such a, such a garment where you can see the, these green lines here indicates where you have the 45 degree bias stretch. Uh, and then if one managed to sort of place that in congruence with uh, the direction on the body, where the body stretches out in movement, then uh, it's possible to sort of reach other functions and and visual visuals then with the tailoring, tailoring matrix it's, it turned out so so gradually there I, I went from an academic research setup into an applied situation doing sportswear uh, and then I went into uh, a collaboration with Puma where we, we finally enough made uh, gaming gear or um, garments for esports. Puma found out that the kids today they don't that they don't look at traditional sports; they look at esports. So they want to sell garments to the esport fans. And what do you wear then? Um, so it's a it's just a short film showing the developments from this basic research into an applied function of e-sport gaming gear, <laughs> which is quite hilarious. Mm. Uh, 
another project based on the research was this uh, T-shirt cut from uh, tubular jersey fabrics knitted in different sizes. Um, there's an old knitting mill close by here where I lived who had been closed down for some 15, 20 years and some friends of mine renovated it and opened it up again and started knitting on the vintage knitting machines where they knit tubes in different sizes. So I thought it would be interesting to see if I can come up with a, a new design for t-shirts based, based on that. And then um, I got hooked on the ID and we um, It's, it's, it's a bit of a bullshit thing with the uh, how much water and uh, resources being used here. But what, what, what I personally find interesting here is just like the, that the, the whole approach was based on the other theoretical understanding and I would never have started this project out at all without the underlying research uh, work. Uh, and you see, the, both, both these films, there's, there's a lot of 3D animations, which have been done through Clo, through, with the help of Clo 3D and some other 3D softwares. And there, when, when I left the university word five years ago, me and my friend Jimmy started uh, Atacac, a fashion brand. Uh, and at the same time, Clothe 3D emerged and we turned, really turned, used that new brand as a laboratory for investigating how can we use the 3D technology. Um, and this is like a two minute film uh, that Clothe put together. It's like an advertisement for the software, but it also tells very good like how we, what we did with Atacac. So I'm gonna start that now. There's the real world and there's the virtual world and more and more in the future you will go in between those constantly. And we want to dress people in both worlds. When we decided to start Atacac three years ago, at that same time we, we came across Clo and realized that so what I've been doing for 10 years prior to that, physically draping fabrics on, on live models, that's now possible to do digitally to a very large extent. When we start the design process and do it digitally, we're ending up with a digital product, which then makes it possible to both like can present it immediately, instantly. So for us, we, the same day we have designed something, we can actually start to sell it in an online store. Or we can post the design um, process in um, social media to just show what we do and see if we get any feedback of it. T today, Atacac works as, as both a, a fashion brand and a fashion consultancy studio where we have the possibility of 
trying different potential solutions that the 3D technology gives us, both on a small scale brand and with larger enterprises. That's part of our vision to like inspire other brands to digitize themselves. It's a very creative way of working. Our aim with Atacac is to be the world's most relevant fashion brand and working with the 3D visualization is a central part of that. Yeah, maybe in the future we will sell more virtual garments than physical ones. I don't know. It's a very fun time with so many possibilities. It's like endless now. We have lists of ideas we just want to do. We use the 3D tools and the 2D tools in clothes from everything from styling to grading to design development to animation to fittings. So, so it really affects all stages of, of what we're doing. Yeah, so that's the digital tools and this is this is a view from just outside of the our studio or, or small factory that uh, I work in now um, it's in Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden and and here we promoted our one hour coats call it squirrel coat uh, and it came then flying in over our studio, um, down landing. Oh, there's two of them, yeah. Um, and, and here we put this together by just downloading motions from Examo and build a story around that. Um, And th this is another early Atacac animation, uh, which I think summarizes very good what we tried to achieve with Atacac. And that is sort of creating new expressions through the usage of new techniques. Because I think it would be very, it would be very tricky to showcase a garment in motion in this way on a live model without being caught up in nudity or nakedness or so even even if this is a very early 3d work which is quite bad in rendering quality i think it has it get we've got a huge uh spreadage than when we made it four years ago um so 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 what would Atacac uh, as a brand, it really, it was based on three different pillars. We did pre-ordering of physical garments based on rendered images and in-house manufacturing and a business model, which I'll get back to. We sold digital garments, which are called virtual wear, and we launched uh, creative transparency uh, which we call shareware. And I will get back to all three of these different setups in a while. Um, but I'll first talk about a bit about the, the in-house manufacturing, which was then connected to the pre-order setup that we set, up to, set out to uh, investigate and explore. So we decided to sell the garments before they were produced. And in order to be able to do that, we, we started uh, our own factory in the design studio, um, which is a quite rare thing in, in Scandinavia because we don't have that much manufacturing industry here any longer. Uh, so Atacac functioned for a few years as both like a manufacturing company and a brand and a design consultancy studio. Last year, we split it out the CAC into two parts. 
So Jimmy is now running the brand at the CAC and I run what uh, I'm in charge of our A industry, which is the uh, design studio with external consultancies and the manufacturing. And here is where you can follow my whereabouts right now on this our, Insta our industry Instagram account or the website. Um, A. So A is then for Atacac or for A's or the first letter in the alphabet. Um, and we just moved into uh, new locations. Uh, so it's, it's basically a small factory for, for manufacturing. Uh, here we, where we do all the design developments and uh, various productions for our own projects and some external stuff. Uh, this is when we packed everything up in the new location a few weeks ago. Um, it's quite traditional in the manufacturing right now, but we are uh, currently uh, moving into robotics and CNC cutting there. And, and here I really see the digitalization that's happening as a way to get closer to production and to do work with the crafts part of fashion in, in another way, rather than going away from the physical. Um, and I always try to be in sort of in the borderline where I find digitalization most interesting is in the borderline between the physical and the digital. So even if we do these digital visualizations and work with a pattern like this in 3D, we try to always like measure the physical fabrics. So we have the correct, uh, um, we have the correct visualizations on the screen. And as we have the manufacturing in-house, the physical sampling is just as important as the digital visualizations. So we go back and forth. I work with, uh, as you see here, a um, vertically placed uh, TV for the 3D visualization. So I can have the garments in scale one to one next to the physical garment. Here is a experiment we did with creating a hologram box for showcasing the digital garments in scale one to one in, in, in the space or in the room. And we do a lot of collaborations around uh, these 3D visualization and motion techniques. So here's, here's, here's two short films around motion capture uh, suits that we designed and produced, uh, which is a very interesting project because we here created the suits that the actors wear when record the motions for the animations that we later use for presenting the design. So it's like a circular uh, setup where we, uh, everything we do go back, could go back another round. Um, so, so these suits are what, what the actors wear when motions are uh, recorded for like Mixamo or stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so, so what, what, what we've been doing with Atacac and I think also what we do now is very much virtual garments, but we make them for real also in the physical world. Um, so with Atacac, we set out to, as I said, like sell garments before they were being produced by digital renderings like this or presentations like these. Uh, 
And we then use this, as I mentioned before, as for selling garments on pre-ordering, selling digital garments, and for the creative transparency. And the pre-ordering was kind of the first thing that came to our mind. What if we can get away from the traditional fashion industry process uh, of things taking at least a year and a half if you're an independent brand from you start to start your design process until you actually get any revenue back. So we looked into this and this was really what we wanted to get away from. So we thought like, yeah, if we apply these new techniques and try to work in a different way with everything from designing, presenting, ordering, orders, produce, and selling, then yeah, we design based on another theoretical model. We do that digitally and use that digital uh, output for present presentations. And then we take orders and sell, gar sell to end consumers before we produce. Then we can go from 18 months to about one month for the whole process. Um, which uh, gave us enormous sort of creative freedom and also the possibility of, of financing our production with pre-order sales. So said and done, we rendered, we designed and rendered a number of garments, we put them up in an online store and we thought that instead of going using the traditional seasonal fashion price model where garments lose their its worth every six months and is replaced by a new collection, we tried to be transparent with the costs and just looked at the basically we looked at the traveling uh, industry and how flight tickets are being sold. Like if you pre-order, you get a cheaper price because you don't have to pay for the stock keeping and the over, potential overproduction. Mm. And then the, the virtual wear or the digital wear is is another part which is really, it's kind of exploding right now, I think. Uh, but if you if you like to see it like that, you can say that this Fortnite is the world's biggest fashion brand. This is where most garments were sold last year. And I think the interesting thing is if you if you look what people wear in these games, it's quite close to a few things that you see on the catwalks, but it's quite far from the everyday wear that people use. I think like Yonaya Watanabe here could probably sell more of these outfits in digital words than in physical words. Uh, with Atakak, we also sold our collections in the digital platform Sansa. Uh, so you could buy these t-shirts either physically on pre-order in the web shop or digitally in the Sansar shop and use them on the characters in the game. And together with Sansar we hosted the first <laughs> online virtual reality Pride Festival, uh, I think this was two years ago. Um, and we lost body stocking also to go with that. So we had the pre-ordering set up, we had the virtual wear, but what is still, what was it interest me most today, now after kind of leaving the Altecac project is the part that we call shareware. 
or the creative transparency that we introduced. And that meant that every time when we released a new style, we also put up the 3D model and the 2D pattern for free downloading, uh, meaning that you could either buy the garment or you can download the pattern and make it yourself. Um, and these, we, we put a create a common license on these patterns, meaning that anyone are allowed to use these patterns in any way they want, as long as they credit Atakak back. And if uh, changing things in them and using them commercially, uh, they need to again share uh, these designs further. And another, in, uh, a very interesting thing that happened when we started releasing these was that we had a customer who bought this green shirt up at the left here. He downloaded the pattern and redesigned it in Clove 3D quite radically. And then he reached out back to me and asked me if he could send me that file and that we could, and, and that if he could use our in-house factory as his like 3D printing service for his design. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. So we made this guy a number of shirts and then eventually we used his design for a new Atakak release. And there, we, I think we really can see the end of the potential end of fashion brands. Because what happens when all information is available for anyone? Well, what is then a fashion brand? So, so what I'm, my main interest right now from an R&D perspective is sort of post-brand decentralization or how, what can happen to the fashion industry uh, with the help of open source and digitalization. And I don't know if you're, if you're Clo users, if you are, you might know that Clo, the 3D solution provider here, they just opened up an online open marketplace a few weeks ago called Closet Connect, where anyone can, any user can upload designs, either for, either sell them or, uh, or share them for free. So here we have a growing library of 3D designs. Parallel to that, we have Digi physical fabrics being launched there, meaning that there's fabric suppliers offering digital fabrics, and those digital fabrics are also available as physical physical ones. So what you see here on the screen is fabrics from a Korean fabric supplier called Swatchon, and they have. They sell only uh, stock fabrics and with no minimum orders, meaning that you can download a digital fabric from here and put on your design, and then you can order any, meat, any yardage from them afterwards. So what, so yeah, so here you see like on the, Left-hand side is the digital fabric, and on the right-hand side here is Swatchon's online store where you can buy the actual physical fabric from. Mm. So what I'm currently working at is developing what we had from Atakak shareware into uh, what I call OSPP, means open source production patterns. Uh, and that is, now being available through Closet Connect. 
so we put together a standard for how 3D, how, how Clove visualization or garment needs to be set, set up to be part of this open source pattern, um, production patterns. Uh, so here I'll download, upload all my designs and also other generic uh, garments. Um, at the bottom here, you see we digitized the number of, we just recently digitized 10 fabrics for digital printing from the Dutch um, uh, digital printer House of You. So that means that anyone can then go in here and pick one of these designs, download it, further de develop it further, pick one of these fabrics, apply to the design, apply a digital printing, render it out and sell it on pre-order. And when one reached a number of garments that is doable for production, depending on what price level one want to be at, then I can send the production order to either to our small factory or another local uh, manufacturer close by where you are. Um, so please go in and have a look here at connect.closet.com and download one of these garments. And in there is a PDF outlining the uh, uh, concept and how these files should be set up. And please submit your designs here to this open source um, community that I'm trying to build. So here, here I really see a potential of, uh, for creatives and individual fashion designers to sell and then produce designs without need, the need to be part of a brand or part of the uh, traditional fashion, fashion system. Uh, so like, so sum that up, you can see like, we have a lot of creative people, here they are red. <laughs> and then we have a lot of people who are interested in, in, in buying things or getting, getting things from these designers. And then we have emerging pre-order platforms online. We now have digi physical fabrics available. And then if we have open source production patterns, we could then one could put together designs here, sell them on pre-order and have them produced by local micro factories. Um, so, so this is like my current main interest of getting this, uh, this going. And we are right now doing some test runs with this, um, with some different designers and platforms. So to sum this up, I would just like to finalize with saying that fast fashion it will soon be unprofitable. It is already illogical and it will either be illegal or unprofitable. I don't know which comes first. Uh, designers as trend stylists, they will be replaced by artificial intelligence. And ecological challenges of today, they are also social challenges. The main thing problem that we face is garments are not expensive enough any longer. And then relate this to that virtual fashion of vanity is already here as, as something existing. People dress up digitally and maybe that's where fashion can expand and what we wear needs to be something else. Seasonal production or the classical concept of collection, I see that as to totally 
outdated uh, and only com collections are the only as commercial construction for delivering garments on seasonal uh, basis. We have like a decentralization coming up parallel to the digitalization and there we should relate to what will happen now post the branding culture. And then I saw in the beginning this um, slides about the program you're running and the ecological setups or, or sustainability uh, um, focus in there. And then I think the most important here is like, we need to see through all the greenwashing and the trends coming up here. Uh, and with that, I mean like trends in academia as I don't know, zero waste design or remake or um, um, and, or it can also be recycled yarns or stuff. That is all greenwashing, I would say. The only thing that matters is that we produce less. We need to get production and consumption down to a level at least where we were at the, in the 60s or the 70s before we can start seriously to talk about to recycle stuff or to upcycle things because that is just like a minimal part of the problems with overproduction. So that's that's kind of my final words for here for this presentation and I know I've been scanning through a lot of different stuff but I wanted to give like an overview of what I've been doing and what is currently on my mind here. So please feel free to ask questions and also uh, go please check out these things I showed for you further uh, online. So thanks for, thank you for listening. ¿Tenemos alguna pregunta? Bueno, fantástico trabajo, ¿no? O sea, increíble, no, para mí es como revolucionario en moda cuando pensábamos que un sistema bastante cerrado de la moda, segunda empresa eh, industria más contaminante del planeta, no tenía solución, no sabes, alguien nos abre como una puerta y, y nos introduce en, en otra forma de trabajar y de pensar la moda. Y espero que no os, os haya sonado como tan raro porque ya estamos trabajando en ello. Entonces creo que os resultará familiar y que incluso ni, ni os habrá sorprendido. ¿En casa hay alguna pregunta o algo? No, bueno, nadie no ha dicho nada. Pues nada, muchas gracias, Ricard. Eh, cerramos aquí el, la, la conferencia y muchas gracias por venir.